John Depp. Okay, welcome to Coronado and the beautiful Lowry Theater. Uh, we all do appreciate your time here. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the 75th Secretary of the Navy. He is a naval officer, a lawyer, a statesman, and uh, a pretty fine actor, as we've seen on, uh, uh, in the movies and on TV, too. So how about a great big Coronado round of applause for the Honorable Ray Mavis. Thank Captain, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for being with me today. You all standing up? Sit down. Um, you know, forgive me a little bit. I can't see much from these from these lights. Um, I'm going to be pretty brief, and then I'll take questions from you. And afterwards, if anybody wants to stay and take a picture or prove to your mama that you actually went to work today um, and that I actually showed up, um, I'll be happy to do that too. What the United States Navy gives to America is presence. We are everywhere. And we're not just in the right place at the right time, we're in the right place all the time. We give the president, we give our leadership options. Options to respond to things like the storm in the Philippines, but also options to things like Syria. We didn't have to surge equipment, we didn't have to surge people. We already had ships in the Eastern Med. We already had ships in the Western Pacific. But to keep doing that, to keep doing that presence that we have given this country for the last 238 years, we've got to work on, I put them into four more Ps, people, platforms, power, and partnerships. Y'all represent the greatest expeditionary fighting force the world has ever known. We have the most skilled, the best trained, the most dedicated, the most competent force that we have ever had. And we've got to make sure that we keep that. We've got to make sure that you've got the tools that you need. Those big gray hulls on the horizon reassure our allies. They deter the people that may be our adversaries, and they provide those options. But you've got to have enough of them. On 9-11, 2001, the U.S. Navy had 316 ships. By 2008, after one of the great military buildups in American history, we were down to 278 ships, and we were shrinking. And at some point, even though the ships we were building had a lot more capabilities than the ones before, at some point, quantity becomes a quality all its own. You're not going to be everywhere you need to be. You're not going to be deployed in the places that we may need, the country may need us to undertake a mission. In the four years before I took this office, the U.S. Navy put 19 ships under contract. That's not enough to protect the industrial base like on the road at NASCO. It's not enough to halt the decline in the size of the fleet. Since I've been secretary, the first four years, we have put 60 ships under contract with a smaller top line. And we're on track right now with the plans that we've got to get back to 300 ships before the end of this decade. Every shipbuilding program that we have 
and we've got aviators in the Saudis. Every aircraft program that we have that the Navy controls, I believe, is in great shape. We're doing stuff like a lot more competition, multi-year contracts, driving the price down, making sure the quality is up, giving you the tools that you need to do the jobs that the country is asking you to do. Third is power, energy. Using fossil fuels is a military vulnerability for us. And that's why I've come up with the goal that by 2020, at least half of all naval energy will come from non-fossil fuel sources, and that's a float and a shore. Now, even in America, produced all the oil and gas that we needed. Oil is still the ultimate global commodity. So every time a Syria breaks out, every time some guy who says, I'm going to close the Straits of Hormuz, the price of oil goes up, sometimes $10, $15 a barrel. Every time it goes up a dollar, it costs the Navy $30 million in additional fuel costs. So in fiscal year 2011 and fiscal year 2012, we got a bill for $2 billion in unbudgeted excess fuel costs because the price of oil just went up quicker than we had anticipated. Now, there are only a couple of places to go to get $2 billion. One is in operations. So we train less, we steam less, we fly less. If the bill gets too big, we build fewer ships, we build fewer aircraft because we can't afford to, to power them. I don't think either one of those is a very good idea. So we've been focusing on platforms and power. And we're on track to do that, to get to that 50% goal, because we need a stably priced, American-made source of energy for our basis, whether it's wind or solar or fuel cells or geothermal or hydrothermal wave, and for ships at sea. And we need to be more efficient in the way we use energy. And we're doing that. And finally, it's partnerships. Partnerships is working with industry like NASCO. Partnerships is working with cities like San Diego, but partnerships is also working with countries around the world. In the first four and a half years I've been in this job, I've been to 107 different countries, and we're doing something with every single one of those. You can surge people, you can surge equipment, you cannot surge trust. Getting to know people, training with them, operating with them, exercising with them, builds that sort of trust. So that's the way I sort of organize my thinking toward this, and I hope that, and I believe we are making progress on all these. The other reason I wanted to talk to you is to thank you for what you do every day. The jobs that you do every day on behalf of America, the importance of those jobs, cannot be overstated. I wish I could give you an absolute, um, with some absolute certainty, what's going to happen in Washington. I can't. We got a budget deal in December that if the appropriations bills are passed, will take us through 2015. And that's a good start, because under sequestration and under the continuing resolutions that come from not passing budget on time, we just couldn't plan. We didn't have any certainty. And we were forced to, we were almost mandated to make pretty dumb decisions. We weren't putting money against strategy. Now, the American people have got every right to believe and to expect that defense spending will come down. We're coming out of two wars that have consumed more than a decade. 
But we ought to be smart about it. How we cut, what we cut. Sequester, continuing resolutions really don't let us do that. So it's a good first step, but it's important to remember that it only goes through 2015. And we could be back in the same place. It's also important to remember that since 2005, we have never, 2005, had a budget passed on time. And for the Navy, that's almost as damaging as sequestration, because you can't put a ship in a shipyard under continuing resolution to get repaired, because that's called an used art. You can't, you can't spend any money on aircraft maintenance than you did the year before, or different aircraft maintenance than you did the year before. Because that's a new start. You didn't spend money on it the last year. We've got to not lurch from crisis to crisis. Give us some flexibility. Give us some adaptability and the ability to put money against strategy, to put money against this defense strategy that is so maritime, and we'll be fine. And as I said, we're, we've got a little certainty. We're able to plan a little bit because this runs through the end of 2015. But the issue is still there. And because of what you do, you deserve more than that. And the American people deserve more certainty than that about the people that they're asking to take on the, the job of protecting them and this country. So, to all of you who serve, thank you and thank your family for doing that. This, and I'm repeating myself, but this is the greatest, the most flexible, the most adaptable, the most legal, the greatest expeditionary fighting force the world has ever known. We have to keep it that way. Thank you. All right, who's got a question, and how am I going to see you if you do? All right. Uh, yeah, your hand went up first. I have a tradition. First question gets a call. So, got it? All right. Hey, can you please uh, use the microphone? Thank you. We should have uh, people. There you go. Thank you. Testing, testing. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, Aviation Maintenance Administration at Third Class Matthew Blatch from the uh, hometown of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, been in the Navy for about a year and a half, and I'm stationed on board USS Ronald Reagan. Uh, my question for you today, sir, is uh, kind of the deal with you were talking about with the spending and benefits. Um, I know that recently there was a bill passed, and I don't know if it's been on the Commander-in-Chief's desk yet or not, about the... Uh, um, about our retirement getting cut uh, for 20 years of service with 50% of our pay and 75% uh, for 30 years of service. Uh, my question being is, is um, why is it that, we, that now we'll be getting less than 50% of our pay for 20 years and 75% for 30 years, yet members that represent us in the House, the Senate, work two years, get a six-figure salary, and they walk away with that until the day that they hit the earth? I'll deal with the first part of that question. I'm going to let them explain the second part. <laughs> Number one, my understanding of what Congress passed in terms of retirement was that it was not a reduction in retirement. It was a reduction in the speed of increase in terms of cost of living allowances. And I do have to say, well, first, whatever retirement system you joined under, the 
current one, that's the one you're going to retire under. There looks to be in touch whether we should change the type of retirement system that we have. That'll happen. I've learned not to make guesses about what Congress is going to do or not do. But everybody on active duty, is my understanding, would be grandfathered in. This system would be the one that you, you will retire under if you spend your career here. But if we don't get a handle on pay and benefits, on personnel costs, there can be a lot fewer of y'all. Because the only place we've got to go if pay and benefits and that counts retirement get too high is to cut personnel. That's it. There'll be a lot fewer sailors. I don't think that's a very good idea. We'll also build fewer ships. We'll build fewer aircraft. And we're there. Personnel costs are going to eat up half of our budget. And so the choice we're making now is whether we give you the tools to do your job, whether we keep the force that we have today. And we've got to get a handle on things like health care costs for working age retirees who have health care through where they work. Right now, if you're a civilian and you're paying your part of health care through your employer, you're going to pay somewhere $4,000, $5,000 a year for you and your family. If you're doing TRICARE as a working age retiree, you're going to pay about $500 a year. Now, that's a deal. It's also eating up budget. It's also eating into how many sailors we can have. It's eating into how many weapons we can buy. And I don't think it is unfair to ask people to pay a little bit more, particularly if you tier it, particularly if you say the increase for your health care cost as a retiree will depend on what your retirement is. So if you retire as an E7, you're going to pay less of an increase than if you retire as an 08 or 09. It will still be the best health care insurance deal available. But if we don't do this, if we don't, I mean, this is the point we are at. I mean, there's no getting around it. The budget is coming down. American people have got a right to expect the budget's going to come down on the fence. And if pay, benefit, and retirement keeps going up, there'll just be a lot fewer sailors. There'll be a lot fewer platforms. I don't think that's a trade you want to make. Now, I think we've got to be fair. I think we've got to keep our promises. And I think we've got to keep faith. But I also think that it is not keeping faith if you make somebody leave because you don't have the money, because those benefits rose too fast. So you probably don't agree with me where I am. Who's next? Good morning, sir. Thomas Merrill, board of the USS Essex, OSSA, coming from Poti, Texas. My question to you, sir, is we know times are tough. We know the economy is tough. We know that I experienced it back home before I joined the Navy. Uh, what, what is there a plan out there to still improve our Navy, even though our budget is falling? Oh, thank you for the question. Absolutely. I mean. Part of what I talked about is we make cuts. What we got to do is cut things that are less essential. 
what we've got to do is make sure we put money into, into the warfighter, make sure we put money into the platforms that we need. Make sure that we're, we're funding the strategy. And to do that, I mean, to, to, to execute this strategy on behalf of the country, we've got to have a great Navy. We've got to have a great Marine Corps. And, you know, the, I talked about how, how much the Navy shrank. Between 2001 and 2008, we, we had 49,000 fewer sailors in 2008 than we did in 2001. And during that same time, the Marines grew and the Army grew. And that makes sense because we were in two land wars. But now that we're drawing down, and the Marines are getting smaller. The Marines are growing from 202,000 to about 174,000. The Navy, to provide that presence, has got to get bigger in terms of platforms, in terms of where we are and what we do. So, yes, there are those plans. Those plans can, um, can be derailed if, um, if the budget, if, if sequestration comes back in or if we keep not having budgets on time. Who's next? I'll just go and walk up to the microphone because I'm really having trouble seeing you. Too tall on you. Good, ap good afternoon, sir. YN3 Shirley, USS Essex, LHD2. Sir, is there a possibility that all four branches of the military will wear the exact same uniform in the future? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what brought that question up is Congress has mandated that we quit having as many camouflage uniforms. And we got until I think 2017 or 2018 to come down on the number. And I think they said no more than three or something. Um, but that's very different from from all uniforms. Um, I mean, y'all didn't join the Navy to wear an Army uniform. Um, so, no. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks. Mr. Secretary, uh, Aviation Electronics Technician, First Class Brandon Mosley from Bend, Oregon. My question to you is in regards to the USS Ronald Reagan. What are the safety concerns and measurements that we're putting in place for our sailors to ensure that the radiation exposure from Fukushima is not exceeding that of the Geiger readings they're, they're getting, inbound and outbound? Um, well, number one, uh, during, the, um, during the relief effort, we had a lot of monitors on the Reagan. Um, that was a special point of attention. Number two, during that relief effort, did the best um, that we could do in terms of keeping the Reagan out of the, um, and supporting ships, another ship that came. Uh, we, we had ships that came up from um, Sasebo and other places into that relief effort, keeping them out of the main plume. Uh, same thing for the pilots and the aircraft that went in to deliver relief supplies. And we have um, continued to, to make sure or to, to monitor the radiation levels. Now, the levels that the Reagan was exposed to and uh, during that time and the other ships that were in there uh, were, were way within normal specs. We're going Keep watching. Go make sure that there's um, nothing, nothing there. But we try to do that not only for for that sort of thing, but for all sorts of health issues and potential um, problems for 
for people. You, you work in a, uh, just day to day, if you're on board a ship, incredibly hazardous environment. I mean, one person explained to me when I was on my ship, said, yeah, you're on a seal ship, middle of salt water, filled with high explosives and, and electricity. Uh, sometimes it's not a good combination. We take these things very seriously. I have not seen anything, and nobody in the Navy, to my knowledge, has seen anything that indicates that there is a problem, was a problem, or will be a problem for the uh, level of radiation that, uh, that the ships that responded to that disaster will have. But that doesn't mean we're not going to keep watching it very closely to make sure that's the case. Hello, sir. I'm Bianca Blanchard from uh, USS Ronald Reagan, LSS and Blanchard. And my question for you is, now that um, enlisted women are eligible for submarines and SEALs, and for the women who are interested in taking that as a career path, how will we, be, how will we qualify for those career paths in the future? Um, Mainly, talk to your detailer, volunteer. Uh, I mean, I was one that made the decision to put women on submarines. Um, and like you said, we're, we've done every class of submarines now for, for officers, and we're moving to do it for uh, enlisted. And that's not something that's going to that's gonna change. That's not something that we're going to ever uh, reverse. So, there, there, there is a career path there, and uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to give your name to one of my aides out here, um, we'll we'll make sure that you you get the information. But mainly, if you want to do that, uh, you do it like you do any other. If you're changing changing your rating or want to want to go to uh, to do something different, is, is talk to your detailer and volunteer, and we need you. So. Hope you do. Good afternoon, sir. I'm MCSN Whoa. Younger stationed here. <laughs> I'm MCSN Younger stationed here at Interface West, and um, I have a question from the on, uh, the online viewership. So, um, Rob asks, what is the biggest challenge facing the Navy now? Well, I think I think we talked about it. The biggest challenge is making sure that as we draw the budget down making sure that as we um, spend less on defense, that we keep the force that we have, we keep the level of skill, the level of training, the level of education that's represented here today and out around the fleet. Second, that, um, that we keep giving you the tools that we need to do, that we are smart in how we, in how we cut things, uh, how we cut the budget how we reduce the spending. Uh, it's not an argument to say we shouldn't be reducing, but it is an argument to say we need to be smart about how we do this. We need to be flexible, we need to be adaptable in how we do this. And given that flexibility and that adaptability, we will keep the great Navy and the great force that we have. Hello, sir. Uh, Petty Officer 3 Class Evan Kenny from Slate, Ohio. Continuing on with the topic of budget, I was wondering if you'd be at all in for or supportive of reinstating a gold standard, um, possibly auditing and maybe eliminating the Federal Reserve as they are currently diminishing the value of our dollar and the petrodollar is resulting in us going overseas, more troops, um, going to Iraq, fighting for no reason really. Um, I'll just be real frank with you. We made the decision on that in the 30s. Uh, it's not going to happen. And it should. There's no. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Wyant Dutomacy from the Unmanned Helicopter Reconnaissance Squadron 1. Um, my current command is actually being disestablished due to lack of funding, and I've been reassigned to the LCS community. Upon researching this community, I have found nothing but negative responses to it that 
it doesn't appear to be capable of fulfilling its mission that it was made for. And my question to you is, is this new platform going to be able to accomplish its mission, or are we pumping funds into a failing program? Okay. Um, the LCS, Littoral Combat Ship, uh, the program started in 2002. First two ships that were built were experimental ships. Uh, they were built with research and development dollars, not shipbuilding dollars. Those two ships are out there today. The Freedom just got back from a deployment to Singapore. And one of the things you have to expect from a first ship of the class, and we've got two variants. We've got one in, built in Wisconsin, one built in Mobile, Alabama, um, is that you're going to have some issues. And it did. Uh, first ships of the class, the, these two first ships of that class had some issues. Now. We've taken those, and we've taken lessons learned, and we are putting it in the next ships that are being built, and we're building. We're going to have 24 LCSs. We've got that many under contract right now, or in the water right now. They're modular. So you put weapon systems on, you take them off. As technology changes, you change those weapon systems. You don't have to change the ship. You don't have to pull into a shipyard and spend eight months there changing a weapon system, you pull next to the pier and you spend a couple of days doing it because it's modular. I think a ship that the LCS is one of the big futures of the Navy. It's very fast, very shallow draft. It can go places and do things that no other ship that we've got can do. And to answer your question directly, yes, it's going to be able to fulfill the mission. And there are missions that we don't know about today that LCS is going to meet. Um, you know, it's had its critics, some in Congress, some in the Navy. Um, but if you look back, when we started building DDG-51s, the early Burt class, incredible criticism against that. In fact, one guy said, if you go on an early Burt class destroyer, you ought to get submarine pay because you're going to sink. Well. That obviously had been the case. When we built the Virginia class submarines, the very first of those, same thing, huge criticism. LCS doesn't look like any other Navy ship. It fills a different need, and it's built differently. Yeah, you're going to have critics. But yes, that ship can do can do the job, and it's going to, I think, show why it's one of going to be one of the backbones of this fleet, because it. We're still coming up with concepts of operation. The weapon systems are still being developed, and but they're already the weapon system. We've got subsea, you know, anti-submarine, anti-mine, and anti-surface. A lot of those weapon systems for LCS are already better than their counterparts that we've got on ships today. And they're getting better all the time. We're doing something called spiral development. Every, every one is improved from the one before. We're also crewing those ships differently. The 3-2-1, three, three crews for two ships, one training all the time. It allows us to keep ships forward allows us to do that present. So I think LCS, number one, is here to stay. Number two is going to be a very important part of the Navy in the future. And I think that uh, 20 years from now, uh, whatever the new ship is in, you'll get the same sort of question about it, but not about LCS, LCS then. All right, I'm going to do one more. And then, uh, like I said, if y'all want to uh, I'll come down in front if you want to do. Um, I mean, I, first I got to ask the people to run my life, my staff, if, uh, if I can do that. Okay. Um, so one more question. Good afternoon, sir. I am information systems technician, third class John Booker of the USS Ronald Reagan. 
And with RIMPAC taking place this year, I was wondering what are your thoughts on RIMPAC and the effects that it has on naval operations of the international community? I, I apologize. I'm going to ask you to ask the question again. I was getting some sort of reverberation, and I was catching about every second or third word. So. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Plus, I'm an old guy, so. <laughs> I was wondering what your thoughts were on RIMPAC and the effects that it takes place on naval operations within the in international community. Great, great question. What y'all probably heard the first heard the first time, but the effects of RIMPAC and the fact that it takes place and the effects on the international community. RIMPAC, the largest maritime exercise in the world every two years off the coast of Hawaii that a lot of y'all have participated in. It's one of the best examples of, we've got over 20 countries sending ships or sending people to RIMPAC. Learning to be interoperable with these folks, learning to how um, other countries operate, learning how other countries do things, uh, getting to know them, I think it's one of the most important things that we do. Um, and it's particularly true with our allies um, that send ships here. It's also true with people who may not be our allies. I mean, China's coming to this one. Um, let them see some of our capabilities and ask them to assume some of the responsibilities that a naval power ought to have. Um, don't be surprised in terms of how people operate. So I think um, exercises like RIMPAC, and that's the biggest one, but the exercises that take place almost every day all across the globe uh, to allow us to operate with other navies. And no matter how good we are, no matter how big we are, we can't do it alone. And we've got to be interoperable. And so I'm a big fan of, uh, of things like RIMPAC. And oh, by the way, for those of you who saw the movie Battleship, the guy who said commence air operations at RIMPAC. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs>